My name is Allison Arnold. I'm the agriculture agent here in Cooperative Extension in Buncombe County, and I'll be your host today. We want to welcome you to Gardening in the Mountains, invasive plants. Since 1998, Bob Gale has been the ecologist and public lands director for Mountain True, a nonprofit agency championing environmental protection for the Southern Appalachian Mountains. Bob holds a Bachelor of Science in Geology and Biology from the University of South Carolina with a special interest in botany. He has spent his life working in coastal Piedmont and mountain forests, salt marshes, rivers, and rare South Appalachian wetland bog communities. So he has firsthand experience with the ecological impacts of non-native invasive plants. Bob also spent many years in the landscaping industry and as a certified arborist working in urban forestry, including serving for nine years on the Asheville Tree Commission. We are so excited to hear from Bob and benefit from his experience dealing with these troublesome invasive plants. So take it away, Bob. Thank you, Alice, and I appreciate that introduction. And thanks everyone for tuning in here. I originally was interested in wild plant botany and uh, there weren't jobs for wild plant botanists back in the early 1970s. There were very few. And I got into the landscaping industry because it was up and coming and all the baby boomers were getting out of college and building houses. And so there was quite a bit of demand and it seemed like a good thing. Unfortunately, for 15 years while I was in the landscape business, I planted thousands of non-native invasive plants in the Piedmont and Coastal Plain regions of South Carolina. So I've been spending the last 25 years of my life getting out in the mountains and getting people out in the mountains, trying to get rid of these things. Now that we know how bad those mistakes were back in the 1970s and 80s. So full confession there and doing penance these years trying to make up for it. So I'm going to talk about several things here, why we care. And under that, I'm going to talk about those reasons of why we care, the impacts of plants, and give a little bit of information about control and different methods. And as a little add-on gift that Allison decided, I decided to do, I'm going to show you five slides of some of our worst customers, at least in the Buncombe County area and many other areas. So why do we care? We care about the effects that they have on native plants, on wildlife, on our waterways, on livestock, and people in general, and recreation. And we also want to know how we can make a difference locally. I was asked that question, so I tried to tweak this presentation a little bit more toward that. For years, all I did was education, telling people what invasive plants were, because they didn't know. Now, pretty much everybody knows, and they know they're bad, and they pretty much want to get rid of them. And we work with a lot of partner organizations and agencies. Allison and Extension Service is a good example of that. Some of them are doing some things and I might be able to throw something in about that. But first, I'd like to get everybody up to speed again on native versus non-native. Most of you may know this if you're master gardeners, but some people may like a little more information. Native or indigenous to the area and they've evolved and adapted naturally for many millennia to our climate, our topography, geology, everything, and also to each other. And they've learned to live with each other. Non-natives, or we used to use exotic, we used to use the term alien. We've thrown those out as politically incorrect, but they're non-native plants produced by us from locations outside this native range. And for good reason, sometimes we thought back in the early 20th century, livestock forage, soil retention, the poster child that was brought in for soil retention, the poster child of invasives is kudzu. I don't think anybody's not familiar with that plant. And for landscape purposes, pretty plants. They also have arrived accidentally in plant containers, and shipping containers, and Bilge water, which is dumped often illegally sometimes in our waterways and aquatic plants seeds come out in that. And I will say a little historical interesting thing is that the first shipping of plants around the world that was successful occurred when Thomas Ward found a little plant growing in a jar and he was experimenting with moths and he put one in a jar and had it outside and he forgot about it and it rusted through the top and he noticed there was a fern growing in it. 
and it got him curious. So he started experimenting with growing plants inside a jar. It was the first terrarium. And he made these things called Wardian cases, which became very famous in the late 1800s. And he shipped plants to Australia and then around the world very successfully. So we really started this business of sending non-native plants somewhere else quite a long time ago. But it reached a terrible sudden jump in the 1970s when landscaping just took off and shipping took off. So anyway, what is an invasive plant? Invasive plants show rapid growth over large areas. They're persistent, meaning they hang around for a long time, year after year. They have abundant flowers, therefore abundant seed production, and they have a high germination rate. For those of you who are gardeners, I'm sure you've all experienced this. I have. I've been gardening for many decades. You buy some seeds somewhere and you plant them in your house and some seed containers or seed flats, and some of them don't germinate. You're like, well, darn, why didn't all this not germinate? Well, these invasive seeds are really good at germinating in many conditions, and they have a longer growing season quite often than our native plants. So they leaf out earlier and they hold their leaves later and that helps them out compete. Can a native plant be invasive? Yes, it can. Examples are red maples, cloakweed, poison ivy, but they're really opportunistic is what I like to say. They're invasive because we have created disturbance that they are able to take advantage of to promote themselves. And my one little defense of poison ivy, we all hate getting it. If it's in our yards, it's okay to get rid of it. It's not going to ever be endangered that I can see, but it's one of the most nutritious berries for our native birds. And our birds who live along edges of forests and fields will eat it. And of course they poop it out along those edges. And so we see it growing around our houses, along trails, along roads, and that's just the way they naturally move that clay around. But in an old growth forest, the poison ivy you find is a big vine growing up a big old tree and all the leaves are way up there in the canopy. We've created so much disturbance for hundreds of years. We've got poison ivy everywhere and we walk through it because it's on the ground. What it's trying to do is to find something to climb up so it can get into that canopy where it wants to be. So naturally, because of all this, we run into it all the time. So we've created our own problem there. Where do the native vases come from? A reference to shipping plates around, around the world. Earlier times, 160 million years ago, and even earlier, continents were in different positions. The plates had moved together. And a lot of these plants, predecessors evolved back then. And as continents separated, many of them kept in the same latitudinal area around the world, like the United States, you see the green there. And where you see those similarities in continents, you'll find that similar species will grow in those climates. So when we bring in plants from other areas that are in those latitudes and climatic zones, they take off. They can grow in our continent just as much as anybody else's. And America has also sent a lot of plants, plants that we cherish. I don't know if they're rare, but we consider them really beautiful and native. They've become invasive in other continents. So humans have created this problem for quite a long time. So where are they a problem? Why are they a problem? They outcompete native plants for space, water, sunlight, and nutrients. And they do other things. They displace rare plant species and are considered equal, if not more than habitat destruction as a threat to our rarer plant species in many areas. They change the characteristics of the soil, water and chemicals. And we'll see a plant that does that. They interfere with natural succession. So it used to be back, I say the 1970s, because in the botany textbooks in colleges, you don't see, but a couple of invasive plants listed. You don't see as many as you do now. But before then, if you cleared an area in a forest and you watched what it did for the next five, 10 years, you would see a succession of Pioneer herbs taking over natives and then pioneer shrubs and understory trees. And these would all give way eventually to a fully mixed deciduous evergreen forest. That was the natural succession. But when you have an area taken over by invasives, you may only get two or three invasives and they crowd out everything else and they stay there year after year. They don't succeed in most cases.
unless you interfere with them. They reduce biodiversity by replacing complex communities with just a few species or sometimes a monoculture. Again, think kudzu or oriental bittersweet or multiflora rose. They can create monocultures pretty well. And they increase the susceptibility of ecosystems to other disturbances, such as fire, erosion, and flooding. And in addition, they harm our crops, our yields on crops, and timber yields in forestry. And they increase herbicide use because we have to use herbicides in large areas in order to try to get rid of these things, or at least keep them under some sort of control. And we'd rather not use herbicide, but that's the only way in these cases. All the time and money that agencies, golf courses, farms, highway people, and all can devote to their normal work has to be then diverted toward management of invasives where they're becoming problems. The economic impact has been estimated many times, and it's always higher than the estimates give. It depends on what you're taking into consideration, but considering agriculture and everything else in the wild and on highways, 120, 138 billion was a uh, number that they came up with in 2005. Thank you, Bob. And see, there is a question in the chat box. Does the economic impact figure go up to 2005 or yeah. since 2005? If the former wouldn't the problem naturally get worse, what is the more updated impact figure almost 20 years later? Do you have an idea about that? I wish I did. It's hard to gather all these because you seldom see a place where they've collected all the different parts of the United States that are dealing with invasives and they report monetary things. So it's hard to get this. So these are estimates, but definitely uh, that was 2005. It's hard to get an exact figure. Periodically, you know, some sector will do an economic impact study. If there's funding and then it can be there for many years. Here's one of the things that I focus on as an ecologist. They alter wildlife nutrition and their feeding habits. And that's something that has not been really focused on as much as the economics of them in the past. So there have been a number of ways this has happened. As you can see by this picture, there was a study that says why yellow birds mysteriously turn red. It was noted that the yellow shafted flickers, feathers, the shaft was turning red because they were eating an invasive plant that put out pure red berries. And that was the dominant vegetation in their area when they wanted to eat seeds. So that's an ecological change and the ecosystem type change. A similar thing that happened was a study up in the Midwest. The female cardinal always goes to the brightest red male because they have the best genes. And in a case where the entire understory was bush honeysuckle, all the berries were red and seeds that were there were mostly bush honeysuckle. There were very few natives. The males would be eating those and even genetically inferior males would have bright, bright red plumage. So the concern is that if the females are mating with lower genetic males, then that can lower the health of that population. So that's an ecosystem concern if that happens. More serious, more immediate than that, you all may have heard this story it's a few years ago now. A group of cedar wax wings, which is a wonderful bird. We all love them when they come in the spring and they consume tons of berries on trees. They move through and they're chattery, they're gregarious. Everybody loves seeing them. They eat all the holly berries or whatever and they move on. In this case, they descended upon a huge planting of nandinas, which are full of berries and they consumed them all, and most of the flock fell to the ground and died a few hours later. Their stomach contents showed that they'd only been eating nandinas, and nandinas have a small amount of cyanide in them. One or two wouldn't hurt, but these birds consume a lot. And they had never encountered this before. This came from a different continent, and they were not prepared for it, and they couldn't handle it. So that's a direct death on a bird eating an invasive plant. Another one that was really troublesome was the Bald eagles were dying from what they found out was a type of nerve disease caused by a cyanobacteria. I went to the conference and listened to the PhD researcher who studied the whole thing. It was traced to the cyanobacteria growing in water plants that were non-native invasives. I believe water hyacinth was one. I think parrot feather was another. And the hooks and coots that lived in the water were eating that. And they couldn't stay upright in the water and they couldn't walk on land. They had to hold their wings out in order to stay upright. And 
Because of that, they weren't able to evade predators and they were attacked by bald eagles. It turned out that disease worked its way through both the water birds and then to the adult eagles and the adult eagles passed the disease onto the eaglets and the nets. So another very serious case of those particular invasives and the cyanobacteria they carry creating this nerve degenerative disease. We're only beginning to learn about some of these things. We've known about the nutrition problem for many years, that invasive plants have nutrition in them, but they're only nutrition meant for birds in China or mammals in Japan or whatever. Ours need our native plants, which have the right type of nutrition for them. But this direct connection to death is a newer thing. And we're learning more and more about invasive plants that we didn't know. So those are the concerns. I do have a list here of some of the severe invasives in the Southern Appalachians. We have a bigger list. I put this on to show the ones that were still commercially available when I made this slide. And now it's been a few years. You're not seeing invasive plants so much sold in re local retail outlets. There are a couple, but not many. And even in the big box stores, you're not seeing them as much because the public is not buying them more and more as they become aware. But a lot of them are available online through the world, you know, you could get them anywhere still. And so that's why there's so many of them listed here that are actually being sold. With that, Allison, I'm open to taking a few questions now before I move on. If anybody has anything on what I've said so far. We did ask a clarification. Is butterfly weed or butterfly bush? <laughs> butterfly bush. Butterfly bush, the shrub. It is now invading around and into the Linville Gorge wilderness area. That's how invasive from homes that had planted it, that live around the area. That's how it got on our list. And that's a real worry for those of us that work in wild mountain areas and all. What about Japanese knotweed? Are you seeing a growth of that? Somebody's mentioning it along the French Broad River banks more and more. Yes, it's definitely there and it travels down rivers. It's not one of the five plants I was going to talk about at the end, but remind me, and I will talk about that because I've got a whole thing to talk about control on that particular plant. Okay, great. And then one more, can you explain why and how Bradford pear is invasive? Oh yeah. The Bradford pear itself is sterile. It's not supposed to pollinate, but if you have other pear trees growing near it, it will cross pollinate with them. And then through time, it reverts back to its original genome, calorie pear, which is highly invasive. And anybody that drives around Asheville highways in the spring, it used to be you looked out and you thought you saw wild black cherries in bloom or cherries, all these white, pretty plants. What you're saying is the calorie pear, which has taken over fields and it's spreading rapidly. Okay, great. Thank you, Bob. Okay. So. How do we control these things? Main ways are biological, mechanical, or manual and chemical. So biological, obviously these things are invasive because they don't have any checks on keeping them limited like they would in their homelands where they came from. They don't have any competition, so they take off. There's something called a flight herbivory, which is simply using grazing and browsing animals, goats and sheep, and even cattle. In certain areas, they can be useful. And of course, goats are introduced themselves. But if you have a monoculture, that's good. They'll eat everything, even the plants you want. So you have to be careful. And there are people that red out goats. And that is one method. The only problem with them that I've heard is that they have to be fenced in. And usually the people that rent them out will use an electric fence, solar powered electric fence. But they need to check on them at least weekly. There have been a few cases where they put them out there and they didn't really check on them very often. And I've heard of one case where a dog broke in a feral dog and it killed one of the goats or almost killed it. And the owners had to send it to the vet and it cost them $2,000 emergency surgery to save the goat. And they basically, after a couple of experiences, decided they didn't want to be in that business anymore. So the point is you have to maintain goats too. It's not so simple. There's a little more to the story than just bringing them in, having them eating your invasives, but they can be really handy in getting rid of a monoculture. And then you can spot tree where these invasives sprout again. The other biological controls that do happen occasionally are diseases and plates. There is a fungus that has attacked Japanese stilt grass, but they try to 
see if they can use it as a control. They haven't made it usable on any kind of wide scale, so it hasn't been helpful. But anyway, these things are out there, and occasionally a native blight or something will pop up and start doing some damage. So that's a good thing if we see more of that. Manual mechanical is the most common thing, and I always recommend if people have a yard and they have invasives to use manual pulling and mechanical cutting, mowing, digging as a first resort, because you can go out there as often as you want. You live right there. Now, if you have a huge piece of land or we're working on public lands, chemical is the only way we're going to get anything done. And I'll talk more about that. When you're composting at home, compost with caution because you don't want to put invasive seeds in your compost because most home compost does not heat up hot enough to kill seeds, but there are composters situations that does heat up enough, but the best thing is bag them and put them in the dumpster. Cutting the seeds off things first, that would be the best thing. If you see berries or seeds, cut those off and bag them. Then you can start trying to kill the rest of the plant because you don't want those seeds to pop up the next year. And you can eliminate a whole year's seed growth by doing that. But here's just several things pruning. If you have English ivy, cut it off the trees. It's growing up right away. Get that part done because English ivy starts to produce seeds once it climbs something. So don't let it climb. And it will eventually overcome that tree and kill it. English ivy is very effective at doing that. It takes a while, but it will kill a tree. So those are just a smattering of different types of manual mechanical things. This guy has a handsaw. If it's too big to prune or a pair of loppers, if it's a big tree, you might need a chainsaw. But anyway, those are mechanical and manual. When is it time to use herbicides? If you have a monoculture that I described, it's not really harmful to spray the monoculture once because you can knock out 80 to 90% of a monoculture with one spray treatment if you do it right and safely. And then after that, you can be more selective and go in and not have to spray. There are other ways. Or if the infestation is just way too large for you to manually do anything and you don't have a crew of people that can do it or you can't pay them. And also if you have limited abilities, mobility or time, if you're young and you're working two jobs, you don't have time. If you're retired, you may not be able to stand on a slope and prune things on your property. So this is a case where foliar spray is very helpful. Most people think when you talk about using herbicides, they say, oh, well, I don't want to spray things in the environment. Foliar spray is only one of the ways of doing it. And here's another scene. Here's some of the tools you would have if you did use herbicides. There's the foliar spray backpack. There's handheld sprayers. Here's your manual mechanical equipment, shovels, Pulaski, loppers, pruners. If you're using herbicides, you always want rubber gloves. If you're doing work with the plants like you normally do, work gloves are fine. And there's a time when you might want to put these rubber liners inside your work gloves. And that is when you use this important little tool here. That's actually a Kiwi liquid shoe polish bottle that's been emptied and has an herbicide in it. It has a sponge applicator on it. And the reason that particular brand is good is because the sponge tip in it has a needle valve. Whereas if you just go to a retail store and buy a sponge bottle with the sponge applicator on it, herbicide might come flooding out of that. You use too much. With this, you can just press it against the stump that you cut and just put a measured amount on there. All you need to go down and kill the roots of that plant. And so that's called cut stump treatment or cut and paint. There's actually a bottle you can buy that's empty bottles, and I think we have them on our helpful sheet that Allison is putting up. But anyway, this is a bottle, but this was just the first picture we could find that, to show a close-up of this. Anyway, this is what I do 90% of any control treatment with, with a group of people that can easily go out and prune and dab on a little bit of herbicide on the stump and move on, and eventually you can take care of things. I want to say a few things though about herbicides. You can use them very safely, but the label is the law. And there's the label, but notice it's not just a single page label. It's a whole booklet. Everything in that booklet is federal and state law. So technically, if you don't follow the directions and don't read it, you're violating the law. Is there going to be a Department of Agriculture enforcement agent hiding behind the bushes to catch you? No, they can't do that. 
but it's important that you enforce how you use it yourself. Read the label. It may have some scary sounding things in there, but those are extreme cases. If you follow the way to use an herbicide according to the label, you can use them safely. Now, having said that, there's only a couple that we use and they're unrestricted so the average public can use them. They aren't some of the real bad chemicals and I wouldn't use them, I don't need to use them, but you can use these safely and you also follow the personal protection equipment. That's a term PPE that nobody knew before the pandemic. Now everybody knows that. So you want to make sure you follow those. As I said on the last slide, there's the PPE, there's protective eyewear, there's rubber gloves. So those glove liners used inside a leather glove work well when you're dealing with multi-flora rose because a multi-flora rose has got thorns and it would puncture the rubber gloves you used. But when you put them inside the leather glove, it doesn't happen. So that makes it safe to hold that little bottle if in case you get any on you. And the chemicals we use do not harm you if you get them on you, but you just don't want anything sitting on you all day. So you should avoid it in every way you can. When you're mixing chemicals, use longer and heavier rubber gloves. So they're harder to work with with pruners. So that's why this works better. And then the other thing I wanted to tell you, when you're mixing chemicals, always use a secondary container, a tray below that. Do everything over that. That way, if you spill any, you can always recover it and pour it back in the bottle. It won't go into the environment. And you'll notice this is on my driveway, actually. You never mix chemicals unless there's no possible way to do something. You don't mix chemicals out in the field or in your garden. You mix them in a safe spot. You have water available. You also can have rags and things in case you spilled some and it starts to move downhill to stop that. I've been doing this since 2005 without harming any of the ecology, working in wetlands, in areas with rare plant species and all. But I promise to you that when you mix this at home, you are going to spill it. No matter how careful you are, it just happens. So always have that secondary container. And I guess I should ask if anybody has any questions here at this point. Thank you, Bob. There was a question about herbicides specifically, like which ones do you recommend or work with mostly? Yes. So every herbicide has a compound name and then it has the brand name. The compound that we use for almost all woody stem plants, because that's what it's designed for, the compound is triclopyr. Do I have that in my handout anywhere? Did I give you anything like that, Allison? I can't remember. No, you didn't. Okay. So triclopyr is TR. I-C-L-O-P-Y-R. Now that is great for woody stem plants. It's very safe. It's been used by Forest Service, Nature Conservancy, many very caring and careful organizations. But every one of these chemicals has a level of cautions to it, so to speak. And this one, just like you wouldn't want to get straight bleach in your eyes, you don't want to get this in your eyes. So wearing your eyewear is very important on this. Again, if you get it on your hands, you can wash it off right away. It's not a emergency or anything like that at all. It's not a problem that way, but you just never want to get anything on your hands and have it sit on you all day while you're working. So keep water and soap nearby whenever you're using any of these. Oh, by the way, the brand name, you can buy a lot of this called Garlon 3A, but that's a two and a half gallon container and it costs a lot more money. I think Ortho Brush Be Gone also has it and you can get that in stores. Always look at the label on the container and you'll see the active ingredient. So it should show that it has triclopyr in it. And then you know that's good for cutting woody stems down to the stone and treating them. Now, if you're doing herbs or grasses, you have to pretty much foliar spray those. And the best compound for those is glyphosate. Now that's the compound that everybody knows the brand name Roundup. And of course, there's tons of information out there and how Many consider the evil corporation of Monsanto, how it has affected agriculture by making corn and different plants immune to Roundup so that they can be sprayed regularly throughout the season to keep weeds down, but it won't kill the crop. Well, the problem I have with that, and that's where the uproar about glyphosate has come out, is the way it's being used in agriculture and on things that we eat as food, unless you buy organic and you avoid that. But without getting into all that, I will tell you that the uh, lawsuits are ahead of the science on pure glyphosate. 
it is true that the inert ingredients that go into these brand names, that's proprietary information. We don't know what those chemicals are. We're not allowed to, but there's a lot of pretty good circumstantial evidence that some of those inert ingredients harm wildlife. But glyphosate itself, the jury is definitely still out on, and it's a very good tool when used right. Keep up with the science, and if it ever found that it really is a definite problem, then we'll quit using it. But we do use it because it's very effective. Those are the two most common ones we use, and they're very harmless. When it comes to kudzu, there is one called Furolid, but the brand name is Transline, and that is specific only to legumes, anything in the bean family which is handy because the way kudzu grows when it's first invading areas of native plants or garden plants, it strings its way through them all and it's hard to get it without spraying other things. And with Transline, you can spray broadleaf plants without harming them. But it's harmful in the water. You don't want to use this close to the water. Look at the label and read the label. So that's very successful on kudzu. All right, this is the little gift I'm giving you here. I'm showing you five plants. I have tons, but I'm just doing five. This is Tree of Heaven. The people may note that it looks a lot like black walnut leaves or sumac leaves, but there's an easy way to identify this plant. First of all, it smells bad. If you break a limb, it smells like burnt peanut, and I've heard other worse names for it, but it smells bad, and there's an odor to it. But the easiest way is to look under the leaves. At the base of each little leaflet, there is a lobe. Sometimes there are two lobes. There might be another one here. But if you grab that lobe with your thumb and forefinger, you will feel this little bump under the leaf. It's a gland, and I don't know what the gland is for, but it's a gland on the leaf. If you feel that, you see the lobe, you feel that bump, you know you've got tree of heaven. And get rid of it, because that tree is one of those that changes the chemicals in the soil. It would spread chemical in the soil, which prevents other competition from growing. And this tree will take over a forest. There's one place where I know I saw it where it was solid tree of heaven, nothing else growing there. It's easily controlled by using a cut stump treatment with triclopyr, but that's how that plant operates. And it does flower, but it spreads mainly by underground roots. Once it germinates, its roots spread and they send up runners. We've had a lot of questions and you may have mentioned this about the best time to treat that as far as time of year and soil moisture. Does it matter on soil moisture? Yeah, mainly rain. Rain is what matters. It's not going to do you any good to go out and cut stumps and treat them with the sponge applicator herbicide if it has rained within a couple hours. The reason is the plant stems and roots have filled with water and they're not accepting anything. If you wait a few hours, it's usually fine and it'll absorb them. Sometimes you can cut a stem and see water dripping out of the stem because it's rained so recently. Well, on evergreen plants, that's important, especially, but on deciduous trees, the best time to treat them is during the growing season. The textbooks say late summer, early fall, when they're sending their sugars down to their roots for the winter, that they'll be taking a lot more herbicide air. And that is definitely true. But I have found in all my years that treating some of our deciduous plants in the late spring and early summer, what's happening then is, yes, they're flushing out, but the traffic is two ways. The uh, water is going up to the leaves and the sugars are coming down because the plant is still feeding its stems, and that's a high growth time. So things are moving fast, and the herbicide will move fast too down into the roots in most cases. I've found that to be very effective with Oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle, for instance. So time of year is important, but also the weather is important. And if you see that they're projecting 50 or more chance of rain later in the day, if you could get a good four hours in before that happens, it would probably absorb an okay. But don't waste your herbicide if you're expecting rain. Wait until it's a good clear day. Okay, well, on the other end of that, several weeks ago, we were in an extended dry period. And we were moderately in a drought. 
is that an effective time to treat or should we wait until we have some rain and plants are more active? I think it's an excellent time. When you read some of these labels, they say it's absorbed better in hot sun and that kind of thing. There may be some plants that halt for their growth in a drought just to stay alive. I can't honestly tell you that I'm knowledgeable about drought, but in dry spells, I have no problem using them and having them kill the plants. Technically, the definition of a drought is multiple years. A dry spell is just part of a season or a whole season. Most people don't know that, but they think drought means two weeks of dryness, but no, a drought is years. That's really great, Bob. Thank you so much. <laughs> this next one is the bad guy, multiflora rose. This is the one that was brought in for two reasons. One, to act as barbed wire fences on farms to keep their wildlife from going out because they're very thorny and they didn't like crossing through it. They were also brought in for highway mediums to block the oncoming headlights. This plant takes over entire fields and it is so bad. Any of you that have dealt with this, and I'm sure some of you have, you've come out scarred and scratched because it's got hooked thorns. They're hooked downward. Most of our native species have straight thorns. They prick you, they hurt, but they let go. You bump up against this guy and you have to extricate it from your clothing because it grabs it doesn't always have these thorns as hooked down. If it's a young plant, an occasional big plants may not have them for whatever reason, but you can definitely identify this plant by looking at the widened stem where it joins the main stem. It's a compound leaf. This whole thing is a leaf and these little things are leaflets. And this is the stem and it's joining the main stem here. Notice how it's widened out there. It's a little green, leafy, photosynthetic material. And all our roses have that, even our native roses and our planted roses, but they also have this stipule pointing toward the leaf stem, up the leaves. But none of them have all these tiny little stipules that look like an eyelash. Only multiflora rose has that. So if you see the eyelash, as I call it, get rid of that plant because it's going to take over. You notice multiflora, many flowers. It's not like most roses. It produces lots of flowers and therefore lots of rose hips. Next plant is everybody's non-favorite now, privet. It's been planted since the 1800s and it smells good, produces white flowers. It can be pruned as hedges, but this thing takes over so horribly and it's just hard to get rid of. But cut stump treatment once again with trichopere does the job. You just have to stay after it. There's not much else to talk about about that plant. It's in the olive family. It produces these little dark bluish black olives. And when you see those form, you want to cut those off and bag them, like I said. Next plant is our worst, worse than kudzu. It's oriental bittersweet. How can anything be worse than kudzu? Okay, kudzu grows where it was planted uh, along highways to hold back banks from the 1930s on to the 50s, and I think they quit planting it by then or in the 60s when they realized how bad it was. But it grows in the sun, and it'll grow up into the edge of the woods, but it doesn't grow into the woods. And it also doesn't have a good pollinator to pollinate its flowers, and it doesn't have a good transportation strategy for moving its seeds around, its, its beans, its legume. But Oriental Bittersweet is the opposite of all of that. It grows in the deep shade, it produces tons of berries, which the birds and mammals will eat and spread far and wide. And you can imagine a bird eating a lot of these and flying into the middle of a contiguous forest and, you know, planting the seeds there. So this thing is really a big problem. It wraps around trees, strangles young trees. The leaves will grow into the top and cover the canopy and harm the tree that way. So this plant is very bad. We used to make Christmas wreaths out of it. People would hang the Christmas wreaths up and after Christmas, they throw this now mostly dead plant out behind their house somewhere. And three years later, wish they had never done that because they're surrounded by oriental bit of sweet vines. So fortunately, you don't see too many of these wreaths at craft shows anymore, but don't buy them. And then again, cut stump. With triclopyr works well, but if you have a lot of it, foliar spray with triclopyr works well. And then the last one is the one we used to talk about, the halls of Ivy League colleges. They're covered with ivy. It seemed okay. Well, it turns out this is a terrible plant. It grows faster than anybody ever quite realized. It takes over trees, will overcome the tree, and kill it. 
And as I said earlier, cut it off the roots, off the trunk first. It'll take a while for those to die, but at least it won't be growing anymore. And then concentrate on the ground. Believe it or not, if it's a monoculture, it responds not very well to triclopyr, even though it's a woody stem plant, but it responds well to a 5% glyphosate spray solution. And whenever you're doing any foliar spray, the goal is to spray 80% of the leaves so that it absorbs it enough to kill the roots. And any more than that, you'll start to see it dripping off the leaves. So you want to stop. You're just wasting herbicide and putting more out in the environment. That's the bad guy because it has a waxy cuticle. It's hard for it to absorb herbicide, but in the late spring, early summer, when the young leaves are new, they're very susceptible to herbicide. And in the late summer and fall, when the plant is sending a lot of its sugars down into the roots, that's a good time to spray. Midsummer, not so good. It doesn't seem to absorb it as well. We've had a lot of questions. There was a question about why English ivy kills trees. Yeah, it, as you noticed, it was growing up the trunks. It grows up the trunks, then it grows out the limbs. And ultimately, it blocks from sunlight the native tree leaves. If you drive through Asheville in the winter or in lots of places, when everything is dormant, you could see English ivy. I'd never realized how pervasive it is. And it's up many old native trees. I was leading a hike on invasive plants in Montreat, actually. And lo and behold, we came across a tree that had just fallen from the heavy night's rain. It made the tree so heavy. The English ivy had overcome the tree and the roots had died. The tree fell over and we had to walk over it and it was covered every part of it. The branches, the leaves, the native leaves could not get enough sugar to put into the roots. So that's how it overcomes them. The leaves crowd out native canopy. What can you do to stop the spread? Learn about invasives and learn how to identify them. You're already doing that. I know you master gardeners already know a lot of this. Obviously landscape your yard, lawns and gardens with native plants. I used to say non-native exotics and you can do that. The only problem is we're also learning that a lot of our non-native exotics, which are pretty and seem okay, may not be helpful to pollinators. There's one case where even a native plant I saw was horticulturally crossed to make bigger trillium flowers. So they crossed the plant many times and got big trillium flowers, but in the process, the plant has to make a trade-off. So it got rid of its sexual parts so it could no longer reproduce. And a lot of these aren't good for pollinators for they can't collect pollen from them or they don't recognize them because they didn't evolve with them. So they don't go to them. So if you can stick with natives, that would be good. And I'll give you a little statistic in a minute about that. Clean your boots, equipment, tires, and your dog before or after hiking or working in an infested area. That's a lot of work, but those of you that are dedicated, if you know these things, I know a lot of you will actually try to do this and that will help. Know the source of fill dirt, gravel, straw, and mulch. You get some gravel from a quarry, you may get a plant. I didn't put it on the list earlier, but it looks very much like a dandelion. And the name isn't coming to me, but somebody may know this, but that comes from corn. So even the gravel you get, you want to make sure they don't have invasives growing in their quarries or where you get your straw from. That's happened a lot. People have gotten bales of straw and it's had invasive, like Japanese stilt grass seeds in it. And same with mulch. So try to research that and get it from a place you know is good. And then get involved in volunteer monitoring and control. And that's something I've worked a lot with, with many groups. And I'm always out trying to teach people this stuff. And then the benefits of native species. You all probably know this. Lower maintenance, pure chemical treatments, maybe none. They're equally beautiful. You need to appreciate them in the way they grow. You don't have to have... The American bigger is always better kind of thing. And they're better at sequestering carbon. And some invasive plants, especially vines, respond well and grow faster in climate change. And I won't go into that, but that's something that's been found. They're better at conserving water, the natives, and they're better for wildlife, of course. So it turns out a study was done by Smithsonian and they found out that in order for chickadees to be viable and continue growing and reproducing populations in your yard, you need 70% of native plants. That was the only study that's been done so far for that, and it was for that particular bird. But it was a very interesting study, and it just gets you an idea of how important native species are.
Here's a fun fact. Native oaks can support over 500 species of caterpillars. Ginkgos, fine. I don't have the citation for that, but my person who did the research on that did have it for me. But anyway, these are things to know. So that ends my presentation, and I'm open for any questions anybody might have. It's really great, Bob. Thank you so much. There's a number of questions about controlling this plant or that plant, and you know the list is long, right? I wanted to ask you in general, if we look at multiflora rows and burning bush and butterfly bush, could we just make a general suggestion that cut stump application is probably the most effective? Yes, it is. Sometimes the way multiflora rose grows, it's quite a bit. And in that situation, if you have a crew of people, even though it's got a lot of biomass foliage, if you can get in and get to the stump and cut it, that's good. What I'll do is I'll get the most aggressive young people with loppers and say, if you can get rid of all that biomass, we can get in there and kill that. I challenge you to do it. And they'll jump right in. Of course, they'll accept the challenge. But people my age, oh, I don't know if I will do that. But, but anyway, that's the thing to do. Get rid of the upper part. And then the important thing when you do cut stump treatment, and this is what we tell everybody, think one-to-one. -one. Try to cut it within one inch of the ground, the soil, and then treat it within one minute. Now, if you can't get that close, okay. But don't leave a six-inch stump sticking up because you're not getting it as close to the root crown as you can. And if you do that, you will have fewer follow-up stump sprouts the next year. So clear away the mulch or the leaf litter and try to see the soil and cut it as close to that as you can and then paint it. If you can, of course, just go ahead and cut it where you can and paint it. If it's growing around a lawn, you can't get under the lawn. Okay, go ahead and cut it and paint it however you can. But uh, the other thing is that these plants have been around for millions of years. They've learned how to seal themselves off from a wound. And they will do that. Some of them can do it quicker than others. Princess tree, if you cut a several inch diameter princess tree with a saw or a chainsaw and listen, you can hear it hissing. It's sucking the sap down in and it's going to seal itself off so it won't accept the herbicide. And it can do that in about, I don't know, some amount of minutes. But we always just say, try to cut it within an inch of the ground and treat it within a minute. If you're five minutes, you're maybe all right, but do the best you can. Great. Yeah, that was perfect because somebody had put in a question about the lag time between cutting and applying the product onto the stem. And so one more question, Bob, before we finish today, there was a question early on about a list of companies or recommendations on how to find companies to do invasive plant control work. And wondered if Mountain True carries such a list. We do. It's a very short list because there haven't been that many people getting into it yet, but I'm happy to say that several of the people that I trained some years ago started their own business and they do this work. If you have questions specifically like that, you can email me, bob at mountaintrue.org, or call me if you have a big question you need to discuss. I could get inundated, but I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, you could do that. <laughs> we can help with that too. One thing I did want to say is that anybody that's hired to apply pesticides on your property must have a pesticide applicator's license. And it's just good practice. And it is required by the law for that applicator to have a license. And you know that they need to follow good safety protocol for themselves and you and your family and your land. So that's very important. I'm glad you mentioned that. You have to get certified first before you can get the license. And you take a core exam. It's all about safety and mixing. And it's very good. And it develops good habits for you. And then you also have to take another exam, depending on where you're working, like forest or aquatics or ornamental turf or highway roadsides, that kind of thing. But they're not hard and they're worth doing. And then you have a license you buy once a year for $75. And again, if you're working professionally, somebody's paying you, you have to have that license. If you're working on public lands, in most cases, the public land manager, forest service, state forestry, park service, or even a land trust, they'll require you to be certified. But you can be certified and then you can supervise a group of volunteers who are not certified. You give them a training before they start and you tell them about the safety protocols. So that's how that works. Thanks for mentioning that, Alice. I've forgotten that.
Okay, I don't want to forget this. We put out this native plant guide for the Blue Ridge, and it's business card size. It fits a wallet, it fits a pocketbook. But due to technology and thin paper, it opens up, and there's lots and lots and lots of information in it. Shows you many of the plants we talked about and more, how to avoid them, and what you can plant in their place as native plants. It has a list of native plants you can get. It also says good for wildlife, good for birds, good for butterflies, good for pollinators and deer resistant. Nothing is deer proof, but some are deer resistant. Uh, it's a wonderful little guide and you can go to our website. I'm really excited about this. I worked for several years to get this put together. And now we printed 5,000 of them. They cost a little money, but they're not much. And uh, help yourself and have fun. Fabulous, fabulous. Bob. And just in our closing moments, there's been a couple of questions in the chat box about how citizens can get involved in controlling and eradicating invasive species, concern about DOT and the right-of-ways and kudzu invasion in those places. And what kind of ideas and suggestions, even homeowners associations, there's a note in there about problems in certain areas. Yes. I wish I could clone myself, but I can't. We work on public lands. Technically, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. So. Our organization can't have me spending all my time on private lands. But if a homeowners association has a group of people that want to get rid of things, I will almost always be able to find the time to go give them this PowerPoint presentation. And if they're really serious, I will give them an outdoor workshop for two hours and show them how to do this. Just help work with them in their area or in a sample area and get them started then they can get themselves certified and licensed and they can do their own work. Also, certain land trusts do this work. Conserving Carolina, based in Hendersonville, it's a wonderful organization and they have events where they do these things and uh, they have AmeriCorps staff. I get one of their AmeriCorps for 11 months each year who helps me do this. But find an organization that's doing this. The Friends of DuPont State Forest, We've just helped them get going and they're doing a great job. There's the Pisgah Conservancy, which is kind of like a friends of the Pisgah district over in the Brevard that goes from Brevard to Asheville, that whole national forest district, the Pisgah Conservancy. You can Google them. They do this work. Both these organizations have volunteer work days once a year where they have hundreds of people show up and they work on trails or work on invasives and everything. So those are some ideas you can do. And I imagine the extension service, I know you have groups every now and then. Volunteer with anyone who's doing this. And if they aren't doing it in your own neighborhood, get yourself up to speed and start a group. My goal, my pipe dream in my mind is that someday every scout troop, every high school group, and every neighborhood is not just going to be going out, picking up trash or cleaning up rivers. They're going to be going out, getting rid of invasives. You know, hey, we'll work on my neighborhood street this week and your street next week. That would be my dream. <laughs> That's great. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. We're just so appreciative of you and all your knowledge and experience. And it's been an excellent program. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today.